Hi, this is Katie Jazowitz from Katie's Casina, and you are listening to the Eat Blog Talk podcast. Hey, awesome food bloggers. Before we dig into this episode, I have a really quick favor to ask you. Go to your favorite podcast player, go to Eat Blog Talk, scroll down to the bottom where you see the ratings and review section. Leave Eat Blog Talk a five-star rating if you love this podcast and leave a great review. This will only benefit this podcast. It adds value. And I so very much appreciate your efforts with this. Thank you so much for doing this. Okay, now on to the episode. Hello, food bloggers. Welcome to eBlog Talk, the podcast for food bloggers looking for the value and confidence that will move the needle forward in their businesses. This episode is sponsored by Rank IQ. I am your host, Megan Porta, and you are listening to episode number 334. Today, I have Katie Jazowitz with me. She is going to talk to us about mistakes made from a veteran blogger and how to regrow your business to flourish with the times. Katie has been blogging for 12 and a half years, 12 and a half on her food blog, Katie's Cusina, and 11 years on So Woodsy, a DIY craft blog. Katie started food blogging as a way to share her recipes with family and friends as a hobby. She left her corporate marketing job in 2014 after her son was born and made this her full-time career. She never fully treated it as a business until late 2019. So learn from Katie's mistakes and what she has learned over the past decade plus. Katie, super excited to learn from you today as a fellow veteran blogger. But first, we want to hear what your fun fact is. Hi, Megan. Thanks so much for having me on. I'm so excited to be here and just share kind of my journey and all about food blogging. Yeah. So, okay. So my fun fact, I was born in Panama in Central America. Whoa. And my dad, yeah, my dad was stationed in the Navy during the time. And I have not one, but two birth certificates, which makes it so confusing for people because I have a Panamanian birth certificate and I have a United States birth abroad birth certificate. Oh, wow. So when you have to show your birth certificate for whatever reason, do you have to bring both? I always bring both and just to be on the cautious side. But I found that once I was older and probably after I was 18, I got a passport and I just started bringing that around because it was so much easier than Mm. trying to explain like, okay, this is why I have two birth certificates. (laughs) They're like, no, wait, what? I probably, they probably don't see that very often. All the time when, when we used to cruise, I, I used to confuse them so much and they're like, wait a minute. Like, I feel like maybe I probably confused them more than what was needed. (laughs) Okay. That's definitely the first time that has been a fun fact. That's awesome. (laughs) Okay. You have an incredible blogging journey and it's been a long journey on the spectrum of like where food bloggers are at. So do you want to start by talking us through your blogging journey, how it's evolved over the years to where you're at today? Sure, Megan. So like you mentioned, I've been blogging for a very long time. I started in November of 2009, back when it was like Blogspot. You mm-hmm. didn't really pay for hosting. I don't even think I had, I think it was katiescusina.blogspot.com. Like I didn't even have a paid domain name probably until probably 2011 or 2012. And I just started it because I was just tired of friends and family and coworkers asking me for recipes. I'd constantly be emailing them recipes. I had just finished wedding planning. I got married in 2008 and I just needed something to fill up my time. And so I said, hmm, you know, I had a coworker who had been blogging, but more of like journaling life stories and stuff. And she suggested that I should start a food blog. So I did not thinking of it ever in a million years take me to where I am today. And I'm sure you probably feel kind of similar. Oh, yes. With that. Yes. Because I just, I like never thought that this could actually be a career and a job. I started out in 2009, just dabbling. I mean, I had awful photos. All of my food photos looked like dog food. <laughs> There was no such thing as recipe cards. Um, You just wrote it on like the blog post. I think most of my recipes back then, it was like two or three sentences that I would write. Not like even a teaser text sentence or like a synopsis of what the recipe was. It was like, oh, I made this for my husband tonight and he loved it. (laughs) 
And I found this recipe at the grocery store, you know, like, I don't know, some random stuff. And then all of a sudden I started noticing that I was getting people from like around the world looking at my recipes. And I was like, wow, this is crazy. And then I learned about food blog conferences. So I started going to those back in the good old days when they were amazing. I mean, I'm talking, I don't, I don't know if you ever went to, I want to say it was, they were held at Walt Disney World. And I can see the logo. Oh, Food Blog Forum. It was put on by, like, Jaden Hare of the Steamy Kitchen. Oh, I never went to any of those, no. I think, I mean, there were a lot of big bloggers that kind of put this on. And they were amazing. One, we were, like, wowed by Disney. People traveled from all over the United States and Canada and stuff to go to these events. And then we also got to learn just from some of the amazing experts at the time. And, I mean, they still are today. So I did, like, food blog forum. I went to blog her food a couple of times. Oh, I went to a wide variety. I went to Mix Conference that was in Virginia. I think it was in Virginia. It was at the lodge where Dirty Dancing was filmed. Oh, fun. So, yeah. So, like, a wide variety of conferences. And I just started learning, like, wow, like, I can actually make money from this. So I started kind of getting – I started learning photography And I started kind of getting serious about it, picking up some freelance projects. And in 2014 is when I made the leap. I mean, by by 2013, I realized, okay, I I can do this full time. Let me write out my corporate marketing job. And then I'm going to leave once I have my son. And my husband was like, okay, we can give it a try. But every quarter, we're going to reassess to make sure that we can still pay the bills. And if we can, great. And if not, then you're going to have to go back to finding a day job. And within the first year, like it was a no brainer. Like we had no issues whatsoever. It was amazing. So, so yeah, so I just kind of plugged along. I would turn out so much content, which is both good and bad Mm. because good, because at that time, Pinterest was like booming. Yeah. It had tons of stuff going viral, hundreds of thousands of page views. And then I had my second child. I had my daughter in 2017. I definitely took more of like a step back and it was very much part-time, wasn't turning out as much content, wasn't taking on as much sponsored stuff, but I had more like year long contracts where like I didn't have to do as much as I was doing before because I had these year long contracts. I was working, I had a year long contract with like Stonyfield. I was working and doing social media management for cost plus world market on the weekends. And then I was also working for like Lighthouse Foods. I had a year long partnership with them. So it was great. It worked out really well. And then as we all know, I feel like 2017, 2018, 2019 is when all these algorithm changes happen with Google. And that's when I started going, all right, something's not working here. My page views are at an all time low. I'm still, I have all this content and why am I not getting the page views? And that's when I learned about really the importance of SEO and SEO audits. Yes. Uh, It sounds like you and I had very similar journeys, Katie. I, much of what you said, I was like, yep, yep, yep. That sounds so familiar, all of it. So why don't we start with that? Because you have learned a lot of lessons along the way. You've made mistakes as we all have, and you've been doing this for so long that you can impart some wisdom to the rest of us. So Would you say that learning SEO is like the number one thing that we should be doing? For sure. And it definitely, I could definitely kick myself because back during these food blog conferences in 2012, 2013, 2014, everyone was talking about SEO. But the problem was, was that when they were talking about SEO back then, it felt like a foreign language. (laughs) There was no one who could break it down in like regular day speak. It was... 100% a foreign language. So I just buried my head in the sand. Like, I'm just not going to learn this. This is too hard. Now I'm like, oh my gosh, if only I would have like listened to these people and knew more about SEO years ago, I would be in such a different place now. But, you know, hindsight's 2020. We all have our different journeys, our different chapters of our lives. And I just have to always constantly remind myself that I just wasn't ready for it back then. And, you know, everyone's chapters are different is what I always tell myself, like your seasonal life. Like right now I have two kids that are now officially in elementary school. So now I can devote more time to my business because now I have two full-time 
students, you know? Yeah. And where like a couple of years ago, I didn't have that. I had two little babies and toddlers. So just taking the time to learn the SEO now is definitely, I mean, one, there's so many courses out there. There's so many, like there's SEO audits. That was not a thing back in 2012, 2013. Or, I mean, if it was, I clearly had my head in the sand. So <laughs> so it, it is taking the time to learn the SEO. There are courses out there. You don't have to go the audit route. I mean, if you are an older blogger or you have like a hundred plus recipes on your site or blog posts in general, I'd highly doubt, like I would highly recommend doing an SEO audit. I went with Casey Marquis. I know that he's not always for everyone, but to me, he is exactly what like I, I uh, needed. He helped me. I had signed up in 2019, in late 2019 for an SEO audit with him for like late spring of 2020. I feel like my like timing, I mean, it would have been great if I would have went a year earlier, but Hey, you know, I mean, you live and you learn yeah. <laughs> and you can't live in the past, but it really helped me because he was able to really dial in, look at all the, the technical issues on my blog, kind of go through fix stuff. He taught me how to write a post that, you know, was optimized for SEO And since then, I mean, since 2020, I've grown my website with over 150,000 additional page views a month from 2020. Now I still have like, you know, he gives you like a 25 page report. So I'm still digging through it. And I just had another audit this past spring with him because stuff changes so, so frequently that it's good to kind of go once a year or once every two years so to make sure that everything's looking good on the back end, that you're still on the right path. You know, when like I did my audit with Casey, he warned me, he was like, there's two types of bloggers. There's the first blogger who's ready to put in the time, the energy and the work that you are going to have to do to dig in, to get your blog fully optimized. And then there's other bloggers who only want to work a couple months and don't see any results and then give up. It like blogging is definitely like the tortoise and the hare. Slow and steady wins the race. And that's definitely what I found throughout the years. Oh my gosh, that's so true. It's like the theme of food blogging, right? Like coming into it, there are always those anomalies who crush it right away and who are the hare and they win, but that is not the norm. Expect slow and steady. And that goes with SEO as well. For sure. Uh, for yeah. sure. And you know, I I like definitely applaud those who like won big early on. It's never been me. And I totally have accepted that. And I've I've moved on with the mindset that my blog and my business will just grow into the business that I want and know it can be over time. But it's not, it's not an overnight like snap your fingers and you're at a million page views a month. It's just, that's just not going to happen. Yeah. At least for me. Right. (laughs) Not for most people, I would say. Yeah, exactly. So don't expect that. And if it does, great. You're amazing. You killed it. You crushed it. Exactly. I mean, that's awesome. But I I feel like definitely newer bloggers now have such an advantage because there's so many courses out there. There's so many resources like this podcast for one. Like there was nothing like that back in the day. And you can learn so much. And when you're starting fresh, you know, you have this fresh, clean plate. I mean, I started my SEO audit. I had like 1,400 recipes on my site, Megan. (laughs) And now I'm at about 1,000. And I still still need to delete out like three or 400 more because I'm never going to get through updating all that. I mean, let's be realistic. I still have a lot to delete. I just had, you you had mentioned, I also have another website. I have a DIY craft website that's kind of morphed over time. And I actually, I just had an audit in May with Casey for that site. Cause I definitely like that site has died. I mean, like <laughs> a really long, slow death. And I, and I know it has a high domain authority score and it has a ton of backlinks and has so much potential, but I just have not given it the time that I've been investing into it. Like I have Katie's Casina and I went on like delete fast. I deleted half my content because Casey was like, you have so yeah. much bad content. And I was like, yeah, I totally agree with you. Like this is garbage. Like no one's ever going to want to read about, Ooh, I like updated my hallway lights today. <laughs> you know, like no one cares about that. <laughs> so like, I definitely got really ruthless with that site. And I wish I could say I could get that ruthless with Katie's Casino, but I feel like 
I get down this big SEO keyword research rabbit hole where like I, I have to like look at Google Analytics and then I'm looking at Google Search Console to see what's going on there. And then I'm like typing in different keywords to see, oh, wait, can like I salvage this? Can I save this? before I, I like even just go and delete it. Yeah, it is a process, especially when you have so much content like you and I do. And it's yeah. like, it's draining and stressful. And I know it's like, oh, poor Megan and Katie, you have so much content, but really it has been a deterrent for me. I feel like what you said earlier about newer bloggers have an advantage. I totally agree with Ugh. you. I feel like we yeah. have a disadvantage. <laughs> oh, for sure. For sure. Because we have so much like, just low hanging for I mean, so fruit, much like, of it. just like content that just is not like giving any value to the reader. No one's ever going to find it for sure. I mean, and especially if it's something like say like meatloaf, that's such a high volume, ser- like keyword search that you're never going to rank on the first page for that. I mean, unless you're like the Food Network. A meatloaf queen or something, yeah. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, I mean, it's like all those just old, really poorly written recipes. I mean, I don't know about you, Megan, but I have recipes that are only half filled out, like the recipe cards, because they're like linking over to a sponsored site. I have some that don't even have a recipe card. (laughs) Yes, I do too. Because it links... It like it like links over to another brand's website and the brand's website has deleted out all their recipes because they they like realize that it brought no value. So it's it's like trying to find this like matrix and of course obviously the time to just have the time to go through it all, to figure it all out, to figure out what the heck is salvageable, what like new stuff do you want to create? I mean, at this point, in the past couple of years, I haven't even I've Maybe in 2021, I created maybe, maybe a dozen new recipes. Everything else was just old recipes that I republished with new photos, with new text. I mean, I just hit that really hard. This year, I'm probably, because I've definitely, I've been expanding on my air fryer recipes, and I've really been trying to build that category out. So this year, I'm probably close to two dozen new recipes. But other than that... Everything else is old, but it looks brand new because it's been buried in the bottom of like the abyss here (laughs) and just trying to give it new life. And like, I know, I know that recipes are amazing. I like just have to show others like, look, this is amazing. And this is why. Yeah. And then there's that category where the recipes aren't amazing. At least I have that category where I'm like, delete, delete. I deleted so many recipes. I also had a Casey audit. And he said the same thing to me. You've got so much content. You've got to like just, I think he used the word ruthless. You've got to be ruthless about getting rid of some of this because it's never going to do you any good. And it's hard because that was my time and my energy for so many years, just busting out content left and right. For sure. I mean, my, my like recipes were, were like my like babies before I like ever had babies. I think I was able to be ruthless with deleting content on So Woodsy because I wasn't as attached, but on Katie's Casino, it's definitely, it's like my, my, my favorite child for sure, (laughs) (laughs) because I spent all my time on that site and I have to like, physically put on my calendar, like, okay, today I'm going to spend three hours on So Woodsy updating posts or doing web stories or doing something of value. Yes. So SEO is important is the bottom line here. That's first For things sure. first. Don't be become, you know, 10 years from now, like Katie and myself, where you're like, oh no, I have to go through a thousand pieces of content in order to, uh, it's, it's not something, it's not a situation you want to be in. Trust us. Yeah. And you know, and I'm sure, I'm sure Megan, you can agree with this. Don't be afraid to go back and like update your older posts that aren't getting a ton of traffic or like, you know, if, if like, if like you are a new blogger, say like you have 50 recipes and there's 10 recipes that like you see are getting very little traffic don't be afraid to go back in there and edit that post, maybe change the title, even though the URL isn't going to match the title, that doesn't matter. Just change the title for something that has a better volume search, depending on your like domain authority and stuff like that. And then go back through and add additional, you know, frequently asked questions. 
sometimes I will start getting a lot of comments and questions on a particular old blog post and I'll start going through and I'll take all those questions and add that into my like frequently asked questions blog. Because if readers are coming to ask these questions and clearly I'm not doing a good enough job explaining it in the blog post. So I'll take those exact questions that they're asking me and put that into frequently asked questions or my like tips and tricks. And I think that's one thing. I think it was taboo back in the day to go back through and edit your blog posts. Like you never did that. Once you hit publish, that was it. You did not go back in and edit it. (laughs) Or like at least I like never did, which is why I'm in the position I am in today. We just didn't know to. Now we know better. We know what we should be doing. So true. And the other thing is, is like I, I like never went in to update my like about me page ever it just stayed stagnant for years and years. And the same with like, I have like a frequently asked questions page. I have I have like a contact page. I have all those pages. You actually should probably go in there at least every quarter and just make sure everything's still relevant. Maybe you, you have been featured on a new really popular website. You want to put that in there because that, that, that shows your authority and it shows your expertise. And we all know that we're, we're, we're trying to strive for this EAT, right? Yeah. Like the authority, expertise, the expertise, authority, and I trust. forget what the T is, but oh, trust. Yep. Yeah. So like, so like going back through and updating your about page on like the quarterly, maybe you set like an alarm on your phone or something. And then also, you know, your homepage, I have the feast theme. It's super easy to update, but I go on almost on the monthly and I'm changing my like top featured recipe carousel to go with the time. So, you know, for summer it was grilling with 4th of July. I had 4th of July highlighted before that holiday. I'll have Labor Day holiday coming up the same with Halloween. So, you know, like all of those holidays, I like to kind of try to highlight those. So that way, if people are looking for a specific holiday, they land on my homepage, which is typically which like kind of blows my mind. But my homepage is like in my top three most trafficked pages on my website, which is amazing because it shows, I guess, that I'm really starting to do a good job with my my uh, SEO. But those people are landing on that homepage. You want to make sure that like you have relevant content yeah. there. They don't want to land on it and see like, oh, you're highlighting Easter recipes when it's like October, you know? Gosh, That's I'm, gonna show, I'm like, okay. guilty of that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I like really try the first of every month I go in or, or the day after a major holiday, I will go in and update my my homepage. I even have it on my like mobile drop down menu, whatever the holiday is, I have a link to that. So say for like, say for Halloween coming up or for Thanksgiving, I will put Thanksgiving recipes and I will link to my like Thanksgiving recipe category or say like my like main dish category or the side dish category whatever it may be, because most people are on mobile. And if they happen to go down and want to go on your recipe sidebar, that's what they're going to see when, when, when they go to click on like the mobile. And I know I, I like, no, I'm not calling this correctly, but the mobile drop down menu yeah. for like your categories. Yeah. yeah. The little hamburger. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So make sure that you're updating those. And then of course, you know, you also have like the backlinks and the internal links. I did an awful job with internal links years ago. I had, I, I, I ended up purchasing Yoast premium because it could tell me all my orphan content, which is all the content that I had never linked to. I had so much after my audit. I was embarrassed. Casey was like, this is an extraordinary amount of orphans. And I'm like, Oh, should I be paying attention to them? I know. No, I know. I had, I probably had over like 600 orphaned posts and I was like, oh, I never knew like that was that important. Now I think I'm in the forties still, nice. (laughs) but like, I'm really happy because, you know, it's not in the hundreds and, you know, a lot of that had to do with deleting a lot of content out and a lot of it had to do with the rewrites and making sure that in every post I am linking 
to around roughly three to five other recipes, whether it's a couple recipes at the beginning of my post or at the end, something similar that I'm recommending. Say it's maybe air fryer or say I want to give some side side dishes to go along with like grilled chicken breast. So it's stuff like that. Like those internal links, that's really important. And then of course, if you are publishing anything that's new, like brand new content, you want to go back through some of your older posts and add those links in from that brand new recipe. And I don't always do a great job about this, Uh, Same, (laughs) but I definitely try to go back through, especially if it's new, I'll like try to go and find like three to five other recipes that would kind of be complimentary or of similar category. And I will go back through and add those links in there, you know, and I'm like, thinking about like some of my air fryer stuff since I'm really starting to build out my air fryer category. So yeah, so that that's another thing. And then, you know, the backlinks are just going to come over time. I wish I could say there was like some magic special sauce to that, but there isn't. There like, really that's isn't. That's just going to come over time. That is the key right there. And back when we started, Katie, it was, I feel like it was much easier to do that because there were so many fewer blogs out there. So some of the bigger sites would be like, oh, Katie's chili. This is great. And then yes. like so many other people would latch onto that and link to it. I have a lot of backlinks and I did not try for any of those. And that might be super Same. annoying, but it's because of when I started and it was just super easy to get them back then. So I am the first one who's guilty of this. Did like you ever participate in link parties? I did for a, a period. A yeah. Thing. I mean, we did experiment with that. Yes. And so like that was a big thing in like uh, the 2010, 2011, yeah. 2012 timeframe. People would host for like those of you who are newer to blogging, people would host these like weekly link parties and they would feature other people's recipes, but then they would also have like a linky tool where like you could submit your own recipe or blog post and holy smokes, I was a big fan of those and I did a lot of it. (laughs) So, yeah. So, I mean, I I guess it's kind of good, but then Casey reminds me like, yeah, but not like all of those links are really that like amazing and important and hold that like high of value. Right. It's so funny to talk about the evolution and where we were and we forget about those things that we used to do and how, yeah, like how things have evolved. So yeah. I love conversations and like then, this. And then, Megan, I know, I know that you have spoken about this too, but your categories, like making sure that your categories are optimized. I never realized that was a thing until my audit in 2020. I'll be the first to admit <laughs> that. So like, giving some links, giving some information to your reader, like a paragraph that explains like what, what that category is about, what they're going to find in that category, linking out to a few of your like most popular recipes for that category. I had, I had an insane amount of categories. Like I'm almost embarrassed to say how many categories I had. And I still have a lot of categories because I just can't figure out how to pare it down anymore. I want to say I have like close to 70 categories, which is ridiculous. (laughs) I like wish I could have been one of those simplistic category people, but I I wasn't and I don't know if I ever will be. (laughs) But just making sure that they're fully filled out because that's really another great way to internal link. And then also just a great place because, hey, that category page could potentially rank first page on Google and land you a ton of traffic. And that's something that I never, ever thought thought about for years was people could actually land on just my category page. Yeah, that's something I think a lot of food bloggers don't really know until you see it in your analytics and you're like, wait a second, what is that category page doing there? And it's doing really well. So you do want to kind of boost those up and give them a little bit of love. Let's take a super quick break to chat about my favorite keyword research tool that I am finding so much success with. Rank IQ is a custom keyword library packed with keywords that are easy to rank for and that also have high search volume. With the ups and downs and uncertainty that comes along with core updates, algorithm changes, and seasonal lulls, food bloggers need to tap into steady traffic that is going to grow over time. Here are a few of my favorite things about Rank IQ. It saves me a ton of time. I can get a new post kicked out in two hours or less. The keyword research tool provides so many great ideas for content that will support my existing recipes. An example of this is how to slice ham. 
I know exactly how fast something will rank based on the competition score and time to rank score. I'm no longer guessing about how successful a keyword will be before spending hours writing about it. I know that it is going to be successful right out of the gate. Go to rankiq.com to sign up and see for yourself how awesome it is. I hope you love it as much as I do. Now back to the episode. And then, of course, everyone's favorite, or maybe not so favorite, I would say it's my not so favorite social media. I knew you were going to say I that. Mean, <laughs> I started Pinterest back when it was in beta mode. Okay, so Same. I feel like I'm a dinosaur right now talking because I got in when it was beta. I was not one of the lucky ones whose pages were featured and got like hundreds of thousands of millions of followers like instantly. I have quite a few friends who did and amazing. I was not one of those. And I, I mean, I, I have a pretty good Pinterest following. Of course, Pinterest has tanked over the past two years and kind of interested to see where it goes. But Pinterest is still my like top referring social platform. Yeah. I like don't know if it is still for you, but for me it is. It is. So yeah, my Pinterest traffic has gone way down comparatively from like four oh, or five years yes. ago. It's really sad, but I've I don't let it bother me because there's always something to fill its place. There's always a gap to fill and things come up. But yes, it is still my top social platform, but nothing compared to where it used to be. Yeah. And then, you know, and then, of course, we have good old Facebook. (laughs) Good old Facebook. I have, I just fill in content. I have content that goes on on that page. I cannot say it gets a lot of like views or anything, but I feel like I only keep it up because sponsors still want Facebook pages and Facebook posts. I don't understand why it doesn't bring any real traffic to them, but Hey, that's how they want to spend their money. I will let them spend it like that, but trying to utilize and find like the Facebook groups, not like only for networking purposes, but also for like the business side of it. And I say the business side of it, like if you have instant pot content, there's a, the instant pot group has like a million plus followers in it and people share those recipes. And when I share recipes in some of those groups, I see a huge spike in Facebook traffic and it's really only from sharing in those groups and not so much on my personal page. Yeah. Those groups can be gold if you find the right one and kind of tread a little bit lightly in there and not maybe overshare your content because that can be a red flag too. Yeah, oh yeah, for sure. Like I am really bad. I like wish I could say that I go on like once a week to share. I probably go on like maybe once a month or like whenever I think about it. So I could be like two or three weeks or two months and I will put up a post or something. So yeah. So, you know, it's all those, you know, maybe setting an alarm and just spending like a half an hour trying to find Facebook groups and putting it in one, once a week. Of course, each Facebook group I feel like has like a million different rules yes. some you can only post on like Monday, Wednesday, Friday. So it's also trying to remember what those rules are, which is probably why I don't post on them <laughs> that often. And then YouTube, I like started that years ago before video was really big. I actually was doing a lot of video and I actually spoke at a DIY blog conference on oh. video in like 20... I think 2014, um, because my husband and I were doing video for the website homes.com. We were brand ambassadors for them. And so we turned out a ton of video for them. And it was nice because we didn't have to edit it. We just sent them all the raw footage and they had their team edit it for us. So like, I definitely had that advantage there. And I just, I never, I did not keep the momentum going. So I've been real, I've been trying to get back into doing more video. I just do the hands and pans. I don't really do like the talking videos anymore. Maybe with the kids uh, both in school, maybe I will start doing some talking videos again because I'll have a quiet house <laughs> for six plus hours a day. So there, there is always that. And then, you know, Instagram and TikTok, I feel like they're two different audiences. Instagram is definitely trying to be a little like TikTok with the reels and stuff like that. I dabbled in TikTok in the summer of 2020. And by that fall, I happened to just get two random, I say random, (laughs) random videos that went viral. And I went from like 250 followers to like 7,000 overnight. And then like another month later... 
I had another video um, go viral that had like 5 million views. And I went from 7,000 to 39,000 followers. Oh my like gosh. literally overnight. Like I like woke up. It was the best adrenaline rush because oh. I was constantly checking it like on like the hour. Like, oh my gosh, I am up to this many followers. That's amazing. Many. Like it was crazy. One was food related and it was just like we were at a restaurant and they were the server was presenting like baked Alaska and he was like pouring quote unquote fire on top of the ice cream. And it went crazy. I think, I think it went partially crazy because people were like, how can you pour a fire? But then also my husband's looks in the background, he had these (laughs) like big eyes and people, he, I mean, he, I think he is what really made my video go viral. And I like totally admit it all the time. Like, yes, babe, you are the reason why it went viral. (laughs) And it got like 2 million views. But my, but my other one, because I was just putting like random stuff up, I wasn't really just sticking with food. My other one was like an ant farm video gone wrong. Like, like we Uh-oh. were transferring ants and I had ants go everywhere. I mean, and I still get people to this day, Megan, asking me on like food videos, hey, when are like you going to bring back the ants? No way. I have this, like, apparently ant farms are a big thing on TikTok and I had no idea. Huh. So, <laughs> so yeah. So, I mean, if you can dabble in those, you know, I, 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 I kind of did it as an experiment. I did not, I never did TikTok as like, oh, it's going to be like a, get rich quick and famous kind of thing. I like just did it just to have it part of my portfolio. I probably post like once or twice a month, some, sometimes a little more, some, sometimes a little less. I mean, I have the platform there and I have made money on sponsored projects because they're happy to see. I have like, yeah, like I think now I have like 37,000 followers. Well, that is inspiration just to keep going because I think that TikTok can be really frustrating because we always hear you have to be on it, you have to be doing it, and then you make it a part of your business strategy and then you see nothing. But I've heard so many stories where it just happens overnight and that's so cool that that happened to you. It does. It's so random. I like wish that there was a formula to that too. But yeah, I mean, just dabbling in it and just to have it because you never know something might go viral overnight. And then look, then like you've just opened up a whole other, a whole other possible stream of income. Yeah. For sponsor posts, you know? Exactly. Okay. So what else, what other mistakes? So we've covered kind of social media, anything else there? No, not, not really for this social media. I mean, Instagram, I, I don't know. I have a love hate with Instagram. I like love to be on it and look at other people's stuff. I hate it because I feel like I've not grown a single follower in like a million years and I am okay with that. I've just, I've just come to the conclusion that that's just not my platform to grow on. And I'm, 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 I have accepted it. I'm with you, Katie, on that. I've honestly, like, if you look at my numbers on the food blog side on Instagram, you'd be like, what? She's been blogging for almost 12 years. It's crazy. But I, for some reason, it just has not been my place. Exactly. And, you know, I, I like used to get all like upset and frustrated. And, you know, obviously everyone as, as much as I try not to compare myself to others, you, you inevitably end up doing it at some point or another. And I've just come to the conclusion. It's just not my place. And I'll still post stuff because I still do get some sponsored work, but nothing crazy, but yeah, it's not, it's not where my like readers are or where like people are that want to look at my content and I'm okay with that. Definitely. So yeah, so let's talk about hiring help because this is something I think that a lot of people think like, oh my gosh, I cannot hire help. I like, I'm like barely bringing in enough money, but I think there's two different ways to hire help. And one thing that I've definitely, my mindset shift and change in the past two years has been like a fortune 500 company is not ran by Mm. one person. They have so many people that work to make their company a success. And for many years, food bloggers have been the, like this one person show. They wear like 20 different hats and that's what has become the norm. I'm happy that as as of recently, I feel like it's becoming more and more accepted if like you have a team or like you you are hiring some help in like different areas. And that's something that I've definitely, it's been my like big shift in the past few years. So the first thing actually that I hired many years ago, back in 2015, when I made my like business official um, with the state is that I hired an accountant because I realized Mm -hmm. I hate, I hate doing all things that have to do with balancing books, with taxes, all that stuff. 
I have my accountant. I'm happy to pay him. He helps me run run my payroll for myself. He helps me with my quarterly taxes and my yearly taxes. And whatever, any other questions I have or concerns, he is there for me. He is the expert in that. And I don't have to spend hardly any of my energy on it. And then I recently hired NerdPress to manage all the security and backups. And they have been amazing and they have helped so much. And then, you know, I've hired programs to help automate and help me just do more. So like Yoast Premium, it gives me all my orphan content. So that way I can make sure that I'm interlinking. And also it gives me stale content filters of stuff that just hasn't been touched. So that's really good. I use the revisionized plugin, which is free. It's not like paid. And that is just what I end up drafting all my like old blog posts that I'm going to create to make new. Yes, love that. So I like use that. I know, I think that Yoast now has um, like a redraft plugin as oh, well. I haven't, I, haven't, heard about that. I haven't used it yet. Casey had told me about it. I'm kind of dragging my feet because I'm like, oh, I just don't want to yeah. learn another thing. Like I have already... I have already perfected this, but I believe that revisionize, I don't think is getting updated as frequently as Yoast is. So, but anyways, yeah. So, and then, and then I use Tailwind still, I have like the most basic plan just to schedule out pins so that stuff is still going out there. I have a Canva pro account so that way I can have all of my branding. I can use whatever images and fonts and all those fancy things that they have in Canva for designing. I've paid for co-schedule so CoSchedule is integrated like in like your WordPress dashboard. And essentially I can push out content to Facebook and Twitter. And so I can schedule it all out through there. So when I'm working on a new blog post, I'll schedule it out for like the same day to push out, like the next week, the next month, I can click this little button so that it will keep like kind of recycling the content randomly throughout the year. Okay. It's not something that's evergreen. I have been using it for a while. I can't say I I get a ton of additional likes using it. And I also can't say that I don't get it. You know, it's kind of like that gray area. But to me, I feel like, you know, it is a way for me to at least push out the content, especially on Twitter, because I'm never on Twitter anymore. But at least then it makes my like, uh, Twitter yeah. feed kind of look kind of up cap. Yeah. <laughs> if like, if like I have a sponsored post, if that makes yep, sense. It does. And then, and then I pay for keyword research. I use key search. Uh, I think it's like, I don't know, 10 or $12 a month. And it's what I use instead of SEMrush or HREFs right. or any of that stuff. Cause that, that can be very pricey and, and more I confusing. <laughs> oh yeah. Way, way more confusing. I use key search and then I pay probably $10 every, I don't know, 10 to 12 months for 100,000 credits for keywords everywhere. Because I like, they have a few tools and I like to be able to kind of see what other people are ranking for, for keywords. And so that keywords everywhere allows me to look at that. So yeah, so I like, I like use a mix of like paid and unpaid. And as of recently in 2022, I have enlisted interns. Woo, that's awesome has been amazing. It's been a goal of mine. It's been a thought in my head for a couple of years and I finally acted on it in late 2021. And I didn't get any interns for fall of 2021. I wanted to, I just started too late, but for January for spring, I had two interns. So it's really just costing me additional time to teach them. And I love teaching. And so for me, I felt like it was kind of a no brainer for summer. I've had three interns. It's definitely been a learning curve. I've had two and now three. I have to really, it keeps me on my toes <laughs> because I have to really do a really good job of like planning ahead, working ahead. Yeah. And then I'm also having to like check a lot of stuff. So I have to put in that, that additional time, like the planning time and then the also time to check. But it's nice because I'll go into my web stories and I have like, 10 Google web yes. stories drafted for me. I just need to go through and kind of edit, make sure that everything looks good. And then I can either hit publish or schedule them out. How did you so, find your interns, Katie? I went to Rollins College here in Winter Park, Florida, because I live in Florida. And I contacted the internship office there and told them, hey, I'm interested in learning about how like I could have interns for my business. 
And they were the ones who told me there's a website called Handshake is what they use. And so I went to Handshake and I created like a business profile. You definitely have to have like a business email address and you have to have an actual business like registered with like the state, okay. stuff like that. Like, like, like it definitely has to be like legit right. business. Since my internships are considered vir- virtual, it all worked out because you can't have like, there's a lot of like rules and laws in place. Like you can't have interns working inside your home. You can't, you know, like, like you can meet up with them in person, but it has to be like in a public setting, like at like a coffee uh-huh. shop or something. So there's a lot of rules, but through that, I I mean, there's a ton of colleges and universities on there. So that's where I found them. My actually, my, my spring interns ended up not doing their internship for credit. They just did it for experience. Okay. So they each did like eight hours a week is what we agreed on. My summer interns, it's like a wide variety. So I have one intern that's for credit. She needs 20 hours a week, which... Is pretty amazing, but it's a lot. Like I have to have a lot of work for yeah. her, obviously, to fill up her time. I have another intern for credit. She needs twelve hours, so it just depends on what what college they're part of. Like one intern's the College of Like Communications, the other is the College of Business. So it's two different intern people that I'm having to talk with at the colleges. It's signing off on paperwork. Like my one intern who needs twenty hours. Her internship office requires me to sign paperwork every two weeks, vouching that she did her time. And then my my third intern this semester, he's a sophomore and he's just wants to learn everything and anything about websites. He actually has a dropship company, which was like so interesting to me. And so he has taught me a lot too, but his his is just for experience to put on his resume. And his is six hours a week. So, I mean, it's been great. I have them, I have them scheduling out all my content and planning all my content on Facebook. I have them That's scheduling amazing. out Pinterest. I have them creating idea pins and uploading them out onto Pinterest. I have them writing newsletters. I have them editing photos. That's so awesome. I don't think people normally think to go this avenue. So I love that you're putting this out there. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, and this is probably something I'll, we can probably, I can probably come back on and talk a whole podcast episode about interns because it's pretty amazing. Like it's awesome. And each, and you know, and I, and I, I've been very transparent with them. Like this is only my like second semester doing this. So it's all a learning curve, you know? And so because of that, yeah. So it's been awesome. It's been great to have that. And there's a possibility at one point that maybe I will hire on an intern, you know, as like a part-time, that's my ultimate goal. But I, you know, for right now, I'm, I'm just playing it semester by semester. So we talked about, you know, like just hiring help, whether it's like actual person or like a system in place, email, email is like so incredibly important. And I know that there's been a lot of podcasts, including yours that you guys have talked about Email. I also, thanks to you, Megan, I switched to Flowdesk in 2020 and I love it. And I love the fact that I don't, I'm not going to be stuck having to pay for all these additional email users. You know, at the end of the day, these social accounts are great. And if you have hundreds of thousands of followers, great. But when there's outages, like what happened earlier in the year on Facebook and Instagram, and you have no way to get to those hundreds of thousands of followers, what are you going to do? Like you have, you have nothing, like you need those email addresses. So I have been able to slow and steadily grow my email list. And I actually have like a corporate marketing email background, but I dragged my feet forever on actually doing email for my blogs. I think I was partially scared that I was going to mess up (laughs) my own stuff. So just trying to grow your email list, I feel like it's so important, really pushing out all those new posts, old posts, new newsletters, whatever you can to your, to your subscribers. Like it's really important. Yeah. Yeah. And that's something I wish somebody would have told me early on is how important that was because I didn't focus on it for a lot of years. And then I was like, oh my gosh, I should have done that. Agree. Like, I wish that when I left my corporate job in 2014 that I really focused on it hard, but I didn't. So, (laughs) so once again, you know, I will just move on and continue moving ahead with the time. Yes. And then, you know, we kind of talked a little bit about video briefly and YouTube. I think 
Definitely. There's such an advantage now. Back in the day, we didn't have phones that had such amazing cameras. You had to use a DSLR or a professional camera to really get a good quality. I remember, I think I was at Sunday Suppers used to throw a blog conference every year, the Sunday Supper movement. And I, it's drawing a blank of what the conference was called. But anyways, Denise and Lenny from Shez Us, uh, and I probably just butchered their <laughs> name because I do not speak French at all. But they had taught a class on like, listen, just pick up your phone and just make some videos. And now, I mean, I feel like it's a very normal thing. And that's really what like I use to do all my hands and pans videos. Granted, they're not 100% professional, but it's better than nothing. It gets the point across. People can see exactly what like I'm talking about if there's a particular like tricky step. And of course, if you're like with an ad network, it's another way to monetize. So you can use that video pretty much across everywhere. You can put it on your blog that can be monetized with your ad company. You can throw it on Facebook. You can throw it on Pinterest. Depending on the format you have it, you can throw it on Instagram and on TikTok. So it's really versatile. Like if you think about it, you can shoot one video and put it on so many different platforms to potentially make a lot more money. Yeah. There are so many ways to repurpose video, especially nowadays, like you said, with great sure. camera phones. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And then, you know, just thinking about like going into kind of more of like processes, you know, creating like different process checklists. Now, obviously, because I've interned, I have created so many documents to teach them, you know, and just write, writing out all of my processes because, you know, there, there's so many different parts to your, your blog and your website. And if you ever want to outsource any of those, if like you have a process manual already put in place, you can give that to the VA or to the intern and they will clearly be able to see like, oh, this is how they create a Google web story, or this is how they write a blog post or scheduling out social media or doing alt tags. So that's something that I've recently started adding in is just creating all these process manuals. And I mean, really at the end of the day, a lot of businesses have them, your business. If like you are treating your blog as a business, you should also have them too. It's just, I feel like, you know, I can never imagine myself selling any of my websites, although I have been given some really amazing offers. But at the end of the day, if you were to sell over your business, you could hand off those process manuals if that was something you wanted to do right. as like an added bonus to them. Right. So yeah, so I know I know that that's kind of like random, but having some process manuals in place or even just a checklist and laying out like, what do you need to do from start to finish to write a blog post? Yeah. That's really helpful in itself. I mean, that that's probably the first checklist that like you could create is just like, okay, I need to shop for like the food for the ingredients and I need to create the recipe and photograph the recipe and edit the photos and write the blog post and write the recipe card and write, you know, and just go down the list like that and starting by there just to make sure that like you have this checklist every single time you go to publish a new post. And then of course, expanding on that, if like you end up do going the route of interns or paid help, that they are familiar with exactly your way of doing things and the way that like you would want them done. Yeah. And Loom videos, I know you mentioned that in your notes. Those are such a great way to capture it on video so that you don't have to write out a bunch of stuff. Those have been great. I have, I have like for, for like my interns specifically, I have like written out process manuals. And then I also include a Loom video on every single one. Of course, like the way that Facebook changes everything and Pinterest, like all of these platforms change often that I'm finding that I'm having to like re-record videos for them. So that way it's like showing exactly what it, what it looks like. But that's really helpful, especially if like you are going to go the hiring route. Yeah. So recipe cards you had as your last little note here. Oh, yeah. Just filling them out like fully. Like every single field that's on there, you should fill out. Like before, a few years ago, I didn't realize that like you really needed to fill them all out. So I have finally gotten through all my recipe cards and they are all fully filled out and it's just, it's better for user experience. It's better for the search engines to find you, you know, the more complete, the better. Yes. 
such great advice. This has been great. Oh my gosh, Katie, you've given us like a long list of things to think about, but all so valuable. So thank you so much for being here today. Thank you for having me. Yeah, this was super fun. I'm glad to connect with you in this way. Okay. Do you have a favorite quote or words of inspiration to share with us? Oh, yes. Okay. So I have this quote by Howard Schultz. He is the CEO of Starbucks and it is, I believe life is a series of near misses. A lot of what we ascribe to luck is not luck at all. It's seizing the day and accepting responsibility for your future. It's seeing what other people don't see and pursuing that vision. Ooh, I love that. That's so cool. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. We will put some show notes together for you, Katie. If anyone wants to go look at those, you can go to eatblogtalk.com forward slash Katie's Cucina. Tell everyone where they can find you online, on social media, and everywhere else. Sure. You can find me at katiescucina.com. C-U-C-I-N-A. I know that you could also pronounce it Cucina, <laughs> the Italian way, but I always say it like the American way. And then I'm there on Facebook. I'm kind of like a mix. I also have sewoodsy.com, S-E-W, as in sewing, woodsy. So I have Facebook pages are Katie's Cucina and also So Woodsy, the same with Twitter. My Pinterest and Instagram are shared. Katie Jazowitz, which is really hard to spell. <laughs> <laughs> and I totally recognize that. And then uh, TikTok, I have my own accounts for Katie's Cucina and for So Woodsy as well. Everyone go check Katie out on all her platforms. And thank you for being here again, Katie. And thank you for listening today, food bloggers. I will see you in the next episode. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Eat Blog Talk. Please share this episode with a friend who would benefit from tuning in. I will see you next time.